Welcome to our Consumer Healthcare Training Academy webinar series, 2022 and beyond. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to see you all from different parts of the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We are so happy you can be here with us today. Our topic today is healthy aging, why the over 50s do need to supplement by Dr. Max Fowler. Vitamin and minerals are essential nutrients that help our body to function well. We all know that the combination of exercise and good nutrition determines our health and wellness. And there is so much we can do to influence this, especially as we age. Today, we will focus on the over 50s to find out why such supplementation is crucial for this group. But before we start, I would like to encourage you to think about these four questions while listening to our presentation and discussion. What excites you? What concerns you? What would you like to know more about? What ideas come to you while listening? And please feel free to pop your questions, ideas, thoughts in our chat box. Our speaker, moderators, will answer your questions towards the end of our session. First, let me introduce you to our speaker of the day, Dr. Max Gowlin. Dr. Max is the founder of Prime 50 Limited, a company dedicated to health and well-being of the over 50s and beyond. Since day one, his passion has been to help the over 50s and stay healthy and stay active by using targeted nutritional supplements. Dr. Max holds a PhD in amino acid chemistry from Nottingham University and kicked off his career initially within research and development department at Procter and Gamble. He then went on to become European and then global R&D director for Rickett Benkiser, developing several products during his time. Dr. Max then joined the JS Group as their chief innovation officer, serving on the company board. Then he later became managing director of a successful sports nutrition company, and finally decided to start his own business, Prom 50 Limited. Many may recognize Dr. Max from his many presentation on QVC TV, which he has used as a platform to both sell the Prime 50 products and to help consumers better understand ins and outs of health and nutrition. Joining us, our, uh, joining our session by our two moderators from the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy, Dave McCocken, our Senior Consumer Healthcare Training Academy consultant and trainer. Dev has spent over 30 years in Asia Pacific leading strategy planning with McCann World Group, one of the world's largest advertising and communication companies. He is a leading expert in insights and market research with an extensive history and knowledge of working on the implications of media changes, how society is influenced by and influences them, as well as leading key initiatives into aging markets of Asia for over a decade. Dev is a speaker at over 500 conferences globally, and no doubt that he is one of the most sought after speakers, trainers, and market researchers. Last but not least, let me introduce you to Steve Salvi, the founder of Exponential and a co-founder of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. Steve has a strong background in consumer healthcare in different cultures, he was a senior executive for Rickett Benkiza and 3M Healthcare. Steve has managed divisions and his teams in Europe and Asia with his belief that people is the most important resource in the organization. Over 15 years, he was invited to speak and train companies around the world in both healthcare and non-healthcare industries. Without further ado, everyone, please help me welcome Dr. Max, Dave and Steve. Yeah, thank you so much, Aim and Max. What a pleasure it is to uh, be with you here today. I mean, first of all, we've been very long friends for uh, a long, long time, very good friends. And 
Secondly, because for Dave and I, this is a topic which is really, really exciting because it combines two passions that we both have. One which is about aging and how we can ensure that we focus and empower and inspire uh, our individuals in our communities as they get older in terms of their health and wellness. And secondly, about the whole topic of prevention and wellness and how do we keep healthy. And nutrition is an amazing part of that. So welcome. Dave. There's, a, there's, a, yeah. there's a third reason, Steve, and that's because oh, yeah. you and I have a vet, we have a personal vested interest in staying alive longer. So this is really important just, just for us, right? Um, and I think everybody watching this will find it really interesting, not because you have to be over 50, but because of the realization that, uh, as Max will point out, unless we get the right nutrients and the right nutrition and we do the right exercise and behave well, you know, our older age for all of us and those that are older that we're connected to in some way is going to, is always tough. And so we just want to make life better for longer. Right. So lots of themes, I guess we're having a running theme across many of these webinars about how to make life longer and better. So uh, maybe this is a great episode for that. Absolutely. So Max would be brilliant. Let's uh, let's share the screen and let's uh, get inspired by some of the science and some of the solutions. Yes, uh, there's a little bit of do. science, not too much, yeah. Steve, but there's a little bit there, a little bit of marketing. Uh, everything's thrown in. I think most people will find it very interesting. If you like my journey from zero to prime fifty, actually becoming uh, a large brand in the UK. Um, but let me start with the introduction slide then. Yeah, no, absolutely. And if I could just say, because for me, it's not just about the, the products, it's about this amazing journey. So I think there's a whole story about how you, with passion, have created a brand in the space of just a few years, where many big organizations have uh, taken much longer and, and maybe haven't even come to market. So I'd like to, to, to talk a little bit about that as well as we go through the presentation. So please, off you go. Thank you very much. Matt. So hopefully everyone brilliant. can see the slides. So yeah, if you could pop it onto presentation mode, Max, that would be yep. brilliant. There we go. Fantastic. <clears throat> So uh, this is a presentation I've actually given. I, I actually gave a similar presentation to this about two years ago in Birmingham NEC to uh, the annual GP conference. Um, mm -hmm. And when I presented some of the data, the doctors nearly fell off their chairs because they weren't actually aware of a lot of the data in terms of nutritional deficiencies and, and the like. So I think we'll come across some of those uh, data as we go through the presentation. So the, the title is why the over 50s do need to supplement. And I've underlined the word do because I, I, I like to make it slightly controversial because there will be a lot of people out there and a lot of health professionals, dietitians, and GPs who think that supplementation is a total waste of time. Um, I will obviously be biased the other way, but I've done the background, I've done the science and I'm absolutely in the camp that we do need to think seriously about supplementation if we get a little bit older because there are huge yeah. benefits. So, I mean, in the last few years, even though I was at Reckitt Benkiza, who makes every product under the sun, I was uh, heading their research and development worldwide at one stage. Um, I then came back to uh, Hull, which is where I live in the north of England, and I was asked to manage um, a sports nutrition company. And I jumped at the opportunity. Um, it was great fun. It's a passion of mine, not bodybuilding, but just keeping fit and healthy. Um, and of course, while I was at the sports nutrition company, it was all about looking good, abs, pectorals, um, you know, keeping, uh, you know, toned up basically. Yeah, but of course, yeah. being uh, well into my 60s, um, I obviously started thinking about, well, just a minute, what about, as you go to bed, what about the over 50s? Uh, are they forgotten? And I, I really do think they have been forgotten, to be honest. So I, I started looking at life expectancy, and this is English data, um, but it will be very similar worldwide, although the lines will be in different places. But basically, you know, average life expectancy is around 80 years, uh, and females get an extra three or four years compared to males. That's a separate debate as to why that is. Um, 
the last two or three years, it's been starting to level off, which is a bit worrying. But again, that's another lecture, I think. Um, but let, let's look at the facts. So at around 60 years old, um, the good news is, on average, you've got at least another 21 years of life. That, that's the average, that's the data, that's the statistics. But the thing which shocked me was life with activity is only an extra 11 years when you're 60. That's a bit worrying. And life without some sort of chronic illness is seven years. So I started to think about, well, it isn't just about longevity. It's actually about health, health span, as a lot of people call it. And here's a nice little graph. Um, you've got lifespan, which is, if you like, um, chronological age along the bottom. And then up the top, it's uh, health span, um, which is, I suppose it's a kind of performance, health performance. And everybody would like to live an extra five years, 10 years, 20 years maybe, but only if they get that extra health as well. It's pointless living an extra 20 years if you end up in a wheelchair for 40 years. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. So yeah. in, in the latter part of life, what we want to do, what we should be trying to do is to live that life as best we can. And I, I do think that you know, supplementation and of course exercise can help. Yeah. You see, I think that was really one of the big aha moments just in the last six months, the difference between lifespan and healthy lifespan. And there is literally, I think here in Thailand, I saw some data that was, there was a decade lifespan in the sort of mid to late 70s, healthy life, lifespan, 65 to 70, literally 10 years where you're still alive, but you have severe issues and severe problems. So I think it's probably not so much about increasing lifespan. It's really about reducing that difference between healthy life and lifespan, really improving the quality of life in, in, the, in the lifespan that you have. That really is one of the most important challenges we have in the health and wellness industry and with our aging population. Absolutely. And there is so much research going on in some very interesting academic establishments all yeah. around the world on this. I mean, this slide is, is a nice uh, sort of next slide from what you just said, which is, well, are we any different uh, as we get a bit older? Well, unfortunately, without going through all of these, um, yes, we are. You know, older people are different to younger people in many ways in that a lot of things are starting to affect us. Type, mm. type 2 diabetes massive, growing, millions and millions of people don't even know they've got diabetes. Um, you know, we're much more prone to cancers, of course, if, as we age. We lose a lot of muscle as we age. That's extremely unhealthy. And I'll talk about muscle loss in a minute. Um, yeah. A lot of people will have high blood pressure. Poly, uh, you know, some will be on polypharmacy. We lose bone density, et cetera, et cetera. So what we want to do as we get older is to try and hold some of these things back. We actually interviewed over a thousand over 50, 60, 70s and 80s before we started Prime 50, because we wanted to understand, well, we're not gonna invent a supplement for fun. Let's see what people think of health and wellness, et cetera. And you know, that's a separate presentation in itself. But we also had six focus groups. I sat in every, every focus groups and it was fascinating to hear what people were saying. Um, but the number one priority without a doubt was people just said, look, as I get older, I just want to stay active. I want to stay mobile, independent, play with the grandkids, walk the dog, go on holidays. It's, you know, when you're 25, it's no big deal. When you're 70, this is really, really important. And, you know, there is so much that we can do to have a really good, happy uh, and, you know, well life. I always put this into my presentation because it's a beautiful example of some people who have actually taken that you know, to the extreme. Yeah, I don't know if this is the over 80s Olympics or what, but you know, this is a beautiful picture of what can be done when you really look after yourself. <clears throat> so thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> but I think I think you're right. It's that uh, we, we 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 pay lip service to the importance of exercise, uh, but actually exercise is actually one of the enablers of increasing your healthy lifespan uh, because we forget we, we, we focus a lot on bone i think as uh, as women get older and i think you're going to talk about that it's a lot about bone density but actually bone without muscle 
is not terribly useful, I have to say. And therefore, really, uh, you know, we lose muscle mass dramatically as we age. So I'd love to learn a little bit more, uh, learn more about that, Max. Well, I'll put a couple of quite scary pictures up in a minute, Steve. And uh, oh, I think some okay. people are quite shocked by those. <clears throat> uh, but it's, it's fact, it's data, but very few people have seen these. Um, so, I mean, what do we need to stay active? Um, clearly, we need to look after our muscle mass, as you just said. We need to look after our bone health, and we need to look after our joint. I call that musculoskeletal health. And that is the single most important thing we need to look after as we age. Right, muscle, here we go. Oh, you right. find muscle. This is actually an MRI scan uh, across somebody's upper thighs. So you can see two legs. It's a 21 year old female or male, it doesn't really matter. The little white in the middle is the bone, of course. Around it, the gray is muscle mass. And then around that is uh, skin fat mass. Okay, so that's a healthy pair of legs. Um, somebody who's uh, about my age, in fact, a little bit younger, actually, that's a typical healthy male or female. Healthy, I say. And this is called sarcopenia. It's just age-related loss of muscle. It's fairly standard. Um, and you can see there's a massive loss of muscle. But more importantly, there's a lot of uh, there's, a, there's a quality decrease in the muscle. You can see yeah. an increase of fat in the muscle as well, and obviously an increase in fat mass around the, uh, the perimeter as well. Uh, wow. That's just fairly normal. But when you see it on an MRI, it just shows you what's going on inside. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it doesn't have to be that way. And this is a fascinating slide as well. This is somebody a little bit older, 74-year-old guy, who's been sedentary all his life, hasn't exercised, hasn't bothered, probably been tapping away on a computer for many years as well in the latter years. Um, you can see horrendous loss of muscle mass. Um, BMI similar, but horrendous loss of muscle mass. And this is somebody who's actually been a cyclist, been a runner, somebody who's actually looked after himself, similar age. I mean, it's just unbelievable, the contrast between these two people. Wow. Um, Max, uh, is that a consequence of, um, you know, changes in metabolism, we're not absorbing amino acids and proteins as, as well, we're not incorporating them into our muscle, um, we're losing uh, protein, or is it because of exercise? As we get older, as we start to suffer from some of the chronic diseases, we tend to slow down, and therefore our muscles will then, of course, deplete. Um, but do, do you know what's the most driving issue? Yeah, I mean, you actually mentioned both of those. Absolutely. Ah, okay. Certainly, as we get a bit older, most people, not all, most people will not be as active. They won't exercise as much. They don't stress the muscles. Uh, and by, you know, by definition, you know, muscles are being destroyed and made every single day. When you're young, the equilibrium is similar. As you get a bit older, if you're not exercising, especially resistance exercise, you will lose a lot more muscle mass than you gain on a daily basis. So bit by bit, you will lose muscle mass. You lose about 25% uh, of your muscle mass before you're 65, which is quite worrying, really. Wow. Yeah, wow. it's one or two percent per annum after about 35, 40. Uh, it's quite expensive. Wow. Wow. Um, and the other is we are uh, less anabolic, i.e. we cannot build muscle particularly mm. effectively as we get older. I mean, I go to the gym, you know, four times a week. I eat plenty of protein. But, you know, I'm holding on to what muscle I've got. I'm not building huge amounts of muscle. Whereas if I was 25, I probably would be. Okay. Um, this is a fascinating experiment, which is a, which is a bit more worrying. This was done by Professor Padden Jones. Um, I think he's an Australian, actually. Um, and he put young people into a metabolic ward. They lay down for about uh, a month, 28 days. Uh, they did absolutely nothing. They did not move. They were paid a lot of money to do this. It was a clinical trial. They lost about 400 grams of muscle from their legs. That's quite a lot of muscle to lose, but it's as expected. Then they tried it with 52-year-old on average. They lost over a kilo of muscle, but they lost it not in 28 days, but they lost it in 10 days. Wow, that's nine times faster decrease in muscle. And then they did it with 67-year-olds. And they lost about a kilo in three days. Um, this is why it is very, very, very unhealthy to have older people go into hospital and then stay an extra day and an extra day and an extra day. And this is what destroys a lot of people, in my view. The fact that they are sedentary, 
they lose massive amounts of muscle and by definition they are going to be less healthy because holding on to muscle is one of the most important things it's got nothing to do with bodybuilding it's got everything to do with health so briefly on muscle facts uh we lose muscle fast as we get older it's difficult to build new muscle we ha we have a kind of anabolic resistance uh like i said we lose one or two percent every year after the age of about 40 and it accelerates 60 65 years old a quarter of the muscle's gone and it's very difficult to build that back uh and muscle weakness is the number one risk factor for falls which of course produce fractures um, and it's, you know, low muscle mass is directly related to putting people into homes and institutions. Yeah. It's a massive cost. And, you know, it, it, I think it was one of the papers in the US a few years ago had a lovely headline, which is sarcopenia will be known as much as osteoporosis is today. Everyone's heard of osteo. Very few people have heard of sarcopenia. Yeah. But it can be. No, this is awful. No, this yeah, is awful. When, when people do go into care, uh, what do they do most of the day? Uh, they sit around. So it, not only does it cause you to go into care, but it's exasperated when you're in care. And that really is diabolical. Um, we should be thinking very differently about uh, the way people are cared for uh, in institutions. I totally agree, Steve. I think going yeah, into yeah. care is can be a dramatic decrease in in uh, health yeah yeah dave you were going to say something no i was just well two quick things one is yes when they go into care and i think well that relates to what will be our next webinar uh but one of the things about going into care you know i often find it interesting that uh just where i'm staying in sydney at the moment there's a couple of care homes very close by and I, I'm really uh, thrilled by the difference between one, uh, as you're talking, Max, because one, if you go past it at any time between about 7.30 and 10.30 in the morning, you can hear very old sort of disco style music. And the reason for that is because they actually have dance classes in there co continuously for about three hours every morning for the people that are in this home. And you can see through the windows, people in all sorts of conditions, at least trying to, to do stuff, right? The other one is dead silence. You never hear anything as you walk past it. You never see anybody. And I just think that's a fascinating insight into the way we've got to think about keeping people moving. The other thing I just want to ask, Max, is, um, you, would, you know, I, I, because we talked about this before and you've just done a great job again of explaining it, but, you know, one of the things that you often see these days um, in a lot of places is people in their uh, 60s, 70s, uh, getting into exercise and getting into it uh, heavily for the first time, maybe in 30, 40 years. Um, you know, sometimes that's tied to retirement or tied to that realisation that, hey, I'm, I'm 60 or 65, a big birthday and I'm going to do things. And I'm just wondering, like, what is the, you know, what is the effect if you haven't been doing much until, you know, for 30, 40 years until you're 60? Um, What's the real effect of getting suddenly you take up, you know, I'm going to become a, a you know, a long distance cyclist and I'm going to cycle for 100 kilometres every morning before breakfast. And I joke, you know, we all know people that have done this. Right. So what effect does that have? Does that uh, in, in taking up those things in a sort of rapid way? Oh, I'm trying to regain it all. Well, you don't do it suddenly. That's the main. Yeah. Advice, yeah. You don't do it suddenly. Uh, otherwise, you're, you know, you're going to be in big trouble, potentially. I think you do it slowly and you get bigger or faster or longer as time goes on. Um, it's, you know, they say it's always good to get, you know, check with your GP. But to be honest, most GPs really are not exercise experts. They're not metabolic experts. I think it would be nice to have an MOT if you really want to be careful. But there is absolute, you know, 60 is young these days. 60 is the new 40. So, you know. If anyone's thinking, you know, if they've never done any exercise, they think, right, I want to start exercise, then start small, start walking, then start yeah. walking yeah. fast. I mean, I did a you know three mile walk yesterday just around the block. And you know, I was very, very hot. Heartbeat went up to 95, but for about, you know, a good but Max, minute. Max, you, you live in the north of England. By definition, you can't be that hot. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, exercise, you can start exercise at 80, for crying out loud. Why not? Just take it easy, 
as you go. Okay. Exercise. Yeah. Oh, you, do raise a, you do raise a good point. I was going to talk, ask about this towards the end of the session, but you make a really good point about the fact that the, you know, the average GP, et cetera, the health professionals actually, in my experience, don't really know a lot about exercise. Um, or what kind of exercise, you know, if I go to the local GP and I ask them here, you know, I'm in this condition, blah, 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 and I'm, I, and I tell them what I'm doing for exercise, I can see it almost sort of like the, they start rolling their eyes with like, okay, well, you're trying to impress me, but they're not actually giving me real advice or telling me what objectives to set or what difference it's going to make. Yeah, uh, yeah. don't get me started about GPs. I mean, GPs have a very, very difficult job. They have to be a sure. jack of all trades. They have to know sure. a little bit about everything, and they concentrate more on pharmaceuticals than anything else, of course. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I've, I suppose, played with GPs on many occasions when I've been, you know, in hospital, or I broke, I broke my heel bone two years ago. First thing I said was, um, can you give me any advice in terms of nutrition, which will speed up the healing? No, no, just eat as normal. And you think, well, come on, you, you missed a massive opportunity of talking to me about vitamin D, calcium, magnesium, weight-bearing exercise, all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, uh, I was at the show two years ago, as I said, I was presenting at the GB conference, and uh, I had to stand with exactly that title on it, you know, why the over 50s need to suffer. And I was trying to get doctors across to have a debate. And one guy came up to me and I said, what do you think of that? And he said, I'm not paid to help people stay well. I'm paid to help people when they're sick. I, I, I couldn't not believe what I heard. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah. So I totally agree, Dave. It's, it's very sad. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move, uh, let's move on. Well, we should move on. Sorry, yes, I've distracted you. Yeah. yeah, we could talk all day about that. It's fascinating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There we go. Um, I mean, quickly, moving swiftly through bones, you know, yeah. Here's a 101 on bones. We've got just over 200 bones. It's 15% of our total weight, quite a lot of bone mass there. Uh, just over half of it is mineral, in other words, calcium and phosphorus, and the rest is collagen protein. Um, and we, we really have maximal bone strength at about 30, 35 years old, which comes wow. to shock for most people. Then it's downhill, I'm afraid. Um, this is what bone looks like. There's a healthy bone on the left, slightly porous, but as you go from left to right, that's aging, if you like. And potentially you can end up with an osteoporotic bone, which you know is obviously weaker. You can see that it's weaker. This is a real photomicrograph of normal bone. And this is uh, a bone which is unfortunately suffering from osteoporosis. You can see that bit in the middle. It's just about fractured or it's just about to fracture. And that's called a fragility fracture. And that's something which can cause huge problems as we get older. This is loss of bone mass with time. So this is the classic graph um, this is age along the bottom and bone mass or bone density uh, on the upper axis. And if you just concentrate on the female pink line, because that is the most dramatic, at about 30, 35, that's maximal bone strength. And then it's a little bit downhill, uh, males as well. But obviously at the menopause, there was actually a huge decrease in bone strength. And that's something to worry about, I think, if you're a woman. And there is so much that we can do during the menopause um, to, to try and fight against that. You can never regain new bone, but you can slow that bone loss down with exercise yeah. supplementation. These are some facts taken off the National Osteoporosis Society website in the UK. Uh, and these are quite interesting facts. So half of women over 50 will get osteoporosis. So it's not just a few people. This is a huge uh, thing that's happening. Uh, 300,000 of these fragility fractures happen every single year, uh, and 90,000 of those are hip fractures. Um, and the red at the bottom, hip fractures, well, it's not a great outcome. Um, the hip replacement operation is highly successful, but a hip fracture, when you're a bit older, it's not a great outcome. So <clears throat> two facts on that. Only about a quarter of people who break their hip ever regain their former level of independence. I mean, that's, that's not a great statistic. But the one which really is the killer, literally, is this one. 27% are dead after a year, uh, after a hip replacement, a hip fracture. Uh, and that is not my data. It was published in Musculoskeletal Disorders uh, a few yeah. years ago. Um, and that's really, really worrying. And a lot of that is down to being sedentary. And of course, some of that will be down to there will be other chronic ailments at the same time as well. So yeah, and, and that is, I can't say it's all 
preventable, but there is a lot you can do uh, to uh, prevent or, or not prevent uh, osteoporosis, but slow it down. Um, you know, so so that you don't get to the point of actually having this uh, this element of uh, a major fracture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll go over the bone health product, uh, not in great detail, but just roughly. Yeah, but that, that would be really, ideas. really good. And uh, again, it's to underline that it's not just about a supplement, it is about exercise. It's that combination of the right nutrition plus weight-bearing exercise that will help most, right? 100%, 100%, Steve. Yeah. I mean, then, of course, good old joints. Um, you know, a lot of people suffer from joint problems uh, as we get a bit older. I mean, this is a knee joint illustration. Mm. There's a normal joint on the left-hand side with the two bones. Um, you've got a nice thick layer of spongy cartilage, which is very high in collagen. Um, and then as we go from left to right, we're getting young to old. And then uh, the person on the right-hand side, you can see the bones are touching. There's no nice gray cartilage bone to bone contact that produces a lot of inflammation it produces yeah. a lot of pain and stiffness um so pretty you know, sure that's my left knee max uh, it could well be it could well be you know we, we you know knee knee problems wrist spine hand it affects all joints um you know the, the, you know it's cartilage right. loss, inflammation pain loss of movement yeah. i think a lot of people understand that um, an interesting statistic, half of people over 50 have actually sought serious medical treatment. That's a lot. Um, mm. It's a massive spend in terms of hospitals in the National Health Service. And that's growing with the aging population and it will continue to grow. Right. It will continue to grow. So, <clears throat> you know, 50% of disablement, if I can call it that, is actually due to poor musculoskeletal health. And that's the thing that I'm really trying to push. So we've mentioned it a few times. How do we call that uh, yeah. this? It's mm. nutrition and it's exercise. They are the two key things. Now, it's a busy slide. You don't need to read it. But, you know, exercise clearly is the silver bullet of health, without a doubt. There are so many clinical research papers in that it will help with, you know, um, you know depression. It will help with osteoporosis, obesity, even cancers, balance to stop us falling over blood pressure, uh, sarcopenia, muscle loss. So, you know, there are so many things that if exercise, you know, being this, if, if you could put exercise in a tablet, it would be, you know, just an incredible tablet. But, yeah. you know, Max, just, just on that slide, uh, you know, it, it really um, uh, sort of underlines for me, um, I always say to people in the industry, uh, look, the best medicine that we can give someone it's actually the person themselves, the patient or the individual or the consumer, however you might want to call it, who is informed about their condition, about their body, about how things work, what could work, uh, that is empowered with different solutions of which the pharmaceutical is only one solution. But um, diet, exercise, mental health are all solutions that we could empower them with. And finally, that's inspired to change his or her lifestyle to improve their health and prevent. Um, and this is something that as an industry, we don't promote. We don't talk about the power of exercise. Uh, there are so many good, um, uh, so many indications where exercise has a positive impact. And yet it's probably the last thing we talk about when it comes to talking about different solutions. I, I totally agree, Steve. Um, I, I was presenting at uh, a care home exhibition about uh, one year ago, and I was doing a similar presentation to this, but I was concentrating on care as yeah. well. And I was looking at exercise uh, and, and, you know, uh, diseases and, and, and preventative, uh, preventative, area, preventative uh, I would say medicine, preventative uh, measures. And it was very clear that when you look at the budget, I think if I remember correctly, only about four or five percent of the national health budget was spent on preventative care. And the rest of it was on picking people up when they've fallen yeah. over, giving them pharmaceuticals and operations and things. So we spend so little on prevention. It's really quite sad. Yeah. And also the other crazy thing is that it can have a real positive effect as part of the cure as well. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I said to you, there was a celebrity participant in the audience uh, today. Uh, and I said that my mother 
has joined us. And she is really a source of great inspiration to me because she suffers from rheumatoid arthritis, but she decided to follow exercise as one of the solutions and studied Tai Chi uh, in her late seventies and became a Tai Chi master and actually trained Tai Chi for others. And Tai Chi became one of the solutions by which she maintained a very positive and very healthy, healthy life. So um, again, just want to say thanks, Mum. Very big inspiration. Fantastic. Welcome Thank to you. Steve Mum. Steve's Mum. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Very impressive. Um, <clears throat> during our research, though, when we spoke to these thousand people over the 50s, right through to over 80s, um, when we talked about exercise, they said, well, it's hard. I'm always, I've always got aches and pains. It takes too long to recover. I'm always tired, not as strong as I used to be. Um, so as you get older, a lot of people find it difficult to exercise. So you do have to be mentally quite strong to carry on exercising, unfortunately. And this is a really key slide. And this is a slide that I talk about on QBC TV many times. And it's what I call the vicious spiral to frailty, which is, we talk about, you know, sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass, loss of strength, which puts a lot of burden, a lot of pressure on joints, uh, which gives rise to physical complaints like joint pain, stiffness, which means, guess what? It's harder for us to become active, which means, I tell you what, I'm going to lounge around, I'm going to be less active, which means I'm going to lose even more muscle tissue. That is a vicious spiral which we have to get out of as we get older. It's very, very serious, this spiral. So that's exercise. So, but let's talk nutrition briefly. So the big question I'm always asking, but Max, surely we're getting enough in our diet. The dietitians tell us, you know, uh, all you need to do is eat a nice, healthy, well-balanced diet and everything will be fine. And they give us lots of advice. Um, and if you mention a supplement, they will typically say, no, um, you, you don't need a supplement. Um, well, I'm afraid we're not getting everything in our diet. And let me quickly show you some facts. And, you know, being a scientist, I only operate on facts. Um, well, let's start with protein, one of the macros, not the vitamins and minerals, let's start with protein. This is a controversial area as well. Um, the World Health Organization basically say we need on average around 60 days of pure protein every day. That's about 0.8 grams per kilo per day. Um, unfortunately, that is wrong. It's out of date. Um, if you look at the latest science, published science from the top uh, gerontologist, protein scientists, they say you need at least 100 grams, roughly. Uh, on average. That's a 50%, roughly a 50% increase, um, if you like. Uh, that is a huge extra bit of protein. And the reason for that is, you know, we're not eating enough. And secondly, we are less anabolic. So you need that extra protein because protein helps build muscle. Protein supplies the amino acids, which are the precursors to building protein for muscle. But how do I eat 100 grams? Because a lot of people can't visualize what 100 grams looks like. Well, that's 100 grams of protein. It's four chicken breasts, not one or two, four. Uh, that's not easy. In fact, it's not possible. If you don't like chicken, then you like eggs. Well, it's, it's actually 18 eggs. Um, so getting 100 grams is not easy. Um, so basically, um, we have inadequate protein intake. That's fact. We know that loss of muscle is rapid as we get older and we have this kind of anabolic resistance, even when we do a bit of weight training or we have weight bearing activity. So the recommendations from this huge international symposium was we need to increase our protein intake by at least 50%. If you can get your hands on whey protein, that's, that's the best, it's the most anabolic. Uh, leucine is, some people may have heard of this, this is an, a very special amino acid which helps uh, muscle, especially in aging muscle. Uh, they're saying don't take it all in one bolus, try and spread it through the day, let's say 20 grams per meal. Um, and also exercise comes back, resistance exercise. And there are even some interesting nutrients like creatine and HMB and others that are starting to make a transition from the sports nutrition industry into healthy aging. Mm -hmm. Then go on to vegetables. Um, I did. Like I said before, I did about 20 radio interviews over the last couple of days talking about veggies uh, and falling out of love with veggies, certainly in the UK. Um, we're not eating our five a day. Um, we know that people who eat lots of fruit and veg 
have a lower risk of chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, et cetera. You know, that's fact, it's data. Um, and WHO and Public Health England recommend we need you know, to eat the five a day. Some people say 10 a day, although I think that's going a little bit over the top. It's too much theory there. But you know, the most recent data shows that 75% of us are failing to meet even that minimum five a day. And that means you're gonna miss out on really important key micronutrients such as vitamin A, C, K, folate, copper, magnesium, selenium, and a few others. And that's not healthy. Um, and it's the same with oily fish. You know, it's another very, very good source of very important nutrients, namely DHA and EPA. These are the active ingredients in fish oil. I think everyone's heard of fish oil and omega-3 but the active ingredients are DHA and EPA. Uh, the recommended intake is about 140 grams of fish, oily fish, I say, per week. And again, the data says the actual intake is about 54 grams. So that means a lot of people will not be getting that, that omega-3 from DHA and EPA from fish. Uh, and that is needed for heart health, it's needed for brain health, and it's needed for vision for very, very good reason. So I've gone right back to scratch and I wanted to look at, are we actually deficient? Forget what the dietitians are telling us in terms of what we should eat. What are we actually eating? And does that mean we're actually missing out on these micronutrients? So I'm not presenting this data, don't worry, but it shows you some of the extent to, that I've gone to. Um, you know, I've looked at data from Germany, Belgium, Denmark, Spain, and it goes on and on and on. And of course the UK at the bottom. And what I've looked at is what is the percentage of over 50s not getting that minimum RDA, the recommended daily allowance. So I've just got a couple of slides here on UK data. Um, it'll be very similar across the world, but there'll be ups and downs. And this is the percentage of over 50s not getting the RDA. That's the recommended daily allowance. And you can see that these are quite large percentages. You know, vitamin D is always the classic over 80 80% plus are not getting the RDA for vitamin D, which is a master vitamin. Look at vitamin E, it's a master antioxidant. You know, it helps protect cells against damage. Uh, folic acid, riboflavin, vitamin A, and then it's the same on minerals. Look at magnesium and iron and zinc. So there's a lot of people who are just not getting these micronutrients and that is not healthy. So we have a real uphill battle here. You know, we're not getting enough micros. We don't absorb them in the gut as we get a bit older, particularly well. We don't make vitamin D in our skin from sunlight as fast as we get older compared to, you know, when I was 25 years old, I need to stay in the sun maybe uh, 45 minutes, whereas my sons and daughter maybe only need to stay in the sun 10, 15 minutes. Um, we have lower micros in food. Cooking methods aren't perhaps as good as they used to be. We have low omega-3, as I said. We have pure veggie intake, uh, and it goes on and on. A lot of people will be on medication as well. A lot of meds interfere with the absorption of things like vitamin B12, et cetera. Um, so we invented this range or formulated this range. It's uh, 550's musculoskeletal range. I'm not here to talk and push and sell, but we have a product for bone, fatigue, joint, and muscle. Uh, the fatigue product we decided because one of the big problems when we interviewed the thousand over 50s was, I'm always tired. Please, can I have something for that? And there's some very good reasons why we're fatigued as we get older. So I'm just going to run through some of the highlights. I'm not going to go through every ingredient and bore people. Uh, so our first product is fighting fatigue or an energy product. Uh, there's no, uh, nothing like caffeine or anything in there, no stimulants. These are genuine, simple micronutrients. But you know, we've got the classic B vitamins, and all of these will have uh, clinically approved legal health claims under the Euro European law, or EFSA as it's called. Um, but interestingly, you know, we know that 20% of people can't metabolize folic acid. So we have a very special grade of folic acid called L-methylfolate. A lot of people have a problem called, you know, with the MTHFR gene. It means they cannot use folic acid at all. Um, so we've got a very special grade that even people with this gene defect can actually use. Um, Vitamin B6, 12, and folic acid together. We want that not just for energy, but to keep homocysteine under control. A lot of people haven't heard of homocysteine. It's a very important, quite toxic thing that builds up in our bloodstream as we get a bit older, and it's associated with cardiovascular issues as we get older. So we have to keep homocysteine down. 
So we have to make sure we have enough B6, 12 and folic acid. We have vitamin C for iron absorption, of course, iodine for thyroid and energy, um, zinc and magnesium to help make new muscle or protein. And CoQ10, coenzyme Q10 is a very important material. We have it, we synthesize it normally uh, in our cells, but as we get older, we don't synthesize it particularly well. So, you know, the mitochondria, these are like the energy cell, the energy battery, the batteries in the cells. We need CoQ10 uh, to make sure that they're efficient. And then in every single Prime 50 product, we searched for a clinically proven um, extract called Bioperin. It's a very special extract of black pepper. And this will actually help the aging gut much better absorb the micronutrients. The aging gut does not absorb particularly well. So Bioperin is added to every single product. And it's the same with bone health. We don't just have the good old calcium and vitamin D. Everyone's heard of bone. But we also have um, vitamin K1, but also vitamin K2. Because vitamin K is needed for bone health. It isn't just vitamin D. Um, and we have vitamin K2. Um, though it doesn't have legal health claims, there is a huge amount of beautiful data published by a couple of top suppliers who have carried out cl cl clinical trials on K2, showing very clearly that K2 can actually help atheroma or ar ar arteriosclerotic uh, buildup um, mm -hmm. by actually taking the calcium that builds up in our bloodstream and actually taking it back into bone. Very, very nice data showing that. Vitamin C, well, we think of colds and immunity. We've got vitamin C in the, in the bone health product because it's needed for collagen formation. For collagen. Collagen yeah. is needed, of course, in the bones. Um, and then bioparin again mm. for absorption. On the joints, we have a number of uh, well-known joint products. We have good old glucosamine. I know it's controversial. Some people say it doesn't work. There are many studies which clearly shows that it does. Um, chondroitin, pyrolonic acid, hydrolyzed collagen, all these have a lot of clinical benefits. MSM, uh, methyl sulfonyl, methyl, and that, that's believed to aid uh, cross-linking of collagen, which is in cartilage because of the sulfur atom, um, and vitamin C for collagen. Then we have some interesting antioxidants like selenium, zinc, vitamin C, because they are uh, antioxidants which have proven to which have clinical trials proving that they can actually protect cells against oxidative stress. This is free radical attack. And of course, joints are under free radical attack all the time. And that's one of the mechanisms which can cause real joint issues. Yeah. And then what's a joint? It also is tendons and ligaments. So we have manganese and copper, again, which have been clinically proven to help with the maintenance of yeah. tendon and ligament health. Yeah. Max, one of the, the, I think one of the problems uh, that causes GPs and doctors not to recommend uh, supplements is the lack of data. As you're doing your research, are you actually finding more and more scientific, really uh, uh, good scientific studies now being developed more than before? Because I have a feeling that this is, this is definitely one of the enablers that will open up supplements and the recommendation of supplements to the medical profession. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think most people have heard of PubMed, you know, which is where most of the uh, proper scientific papers are published. And the, you know, it doesn't matter what area you're looking at. There will always be some pub published papers which are very positive for a particular yeah. ingredient. And there will be other papers where they have shown no benefit. Yeah. Uh, the problem is a lot of people, especially the press, love a negative report. They love a negative report. Like there's, uh, I think there's about 4,000 studies on the, uh, on, on, on omega-3, DHA and EPA from omega-3, how it can help heart health, et cetera. But there was just one association study and it wasn't even a, a randomized controlled trial. It was an association study linking uh, uh, prostate cancer to uh, fish oil. It was later totally discredited uh, by top scientists. But the press loved it. They jumped on it. And of course, all over the world, it was fish oil is a waste of time. It's a disaster. Yeah. It can give yeah. prostate cancer. Absolute nonsense. Yeah. But I tell you, you have to be so careful. The negative, the negative reports you know, are covered in the press. The positive reports, less so. So you do have to be very careful when you look at these. Okay. Let's, let's carry on. We've only got about 10 minutes left. And I do want to get some questions in okay. here as well, Max. 
I mean, we talked about maintaining muscle being very important. You know, we're, we're using the, the whey protein uh, as advised by the top scientists here to, to help with muscle mass. Leucine, we, we talked about, because that plays a really key role. So we've added leucine uh, yeah. in helping the aging muscle. And we have a whole bunch of other ingredients in terms of muscle function, protein synthesis. Cool. We've got lactase enzyme in there to help with lactose because we know we're bringing in a little bit of lactose with any milk derived product. We've got good old bioparin again there to help with bioavailability. We've even got inulin, uh, which is a great source of fiber and also flaxseed, which is another omega-3. And of course, there's no added sugar. The last thing you want to do is to give lots of sugar to uh, people who are over 50 because many of those people will be suffering from diabetes, but also there will be a lot of people who really will be really good um, We also have a patented healthy aging blend. Now, we know that um, you know, there are lots of vitamins and minerals that people will be missing out on. I mean, take vitamin D. We, we add that to every product, not just the bone product. The reason for that is vitamin D also helps with muscle health. It helps with bone health and immunity, the master vitamin, and also falls. You know, there's a there's a legal health claim saying that it will help prevent falls in the over 60s. So we have four times the RDA of vitamin D in every single product. Homocysteine we talked about already. Chromium is in everything because we have to manage sugar. Most people will be, well, not many people will be diabetic or pre-diabetic. Um, vitamin C, you can see the benefits there. Riboflavin for energy and vision. We know that there's a massive amount of people who are uh, very, very uh, deficient in riboflavin. Zinc. Uh, is a fantastic mineral covering so many areas. And we know that zinc deficiency is very high. Um, and then we have other materials like vitamin E, selenium, grapeseed extract, because that, that helps with oxidative stress uh, and potentially inflammation. So the, ask, the last area is um, in addition to musculoskeletal health, though we've got lots of other areas like beauty and vision and heart. We, we haven't got time to talk about those today, but I thought I'd put three slides, four slides in to talk briefly about immunity, because that is so, so important as we get older. And of course, in the current situation, everyone wants to have their immune system pumped up as much as possible. So what gives rise to a poor immune system? Well, you can read it yourself. Poor diet, low in micros, if you're lazing around being sedentary, stress is bad for immunity, poor sleep, certainly. And also, if you over-exercise, People who really push themselves to the limit will have a poor immune function. Um, so what we've done is looked at all the master vitamins and minerals. A lot of people think vitamin C, that's good enough. I'm not a fan of single vitamins myself. So what we've done is put all the immunity vitamins and minerals into this particular product. So vitamin D, I always say that is the master immunity, the, the master immunity product. Um, there's an enormous amount of controversy about vitamin D and COVID. Uh, I am certainly a believer that there is a massive benefit for vitamin D and your immune function. And there's a lot of very interesting work now being published uh, in Spain showing that vitamin D does clearly help. Um, vitamin B6, folic acid, C12, uh, selenium, copper, and iron. These are all needed for immunity. It's not just vitamin C and D. Just to remind people on immunity, I've taken the immunity vitamins and minerals here, and I've looked at the percentage of people over 50 not getting that minimum dose, the recommended daily allowance. And I won't go through it all, but you can see these are huge percentages, 83% not getting enough vitamin D, you know, 86% not enough iron, 75% selenium. If you're lacking just one or two of these, clearly your immune function won't be firing on six cylinders. Um, and the microbiome, we've also added uh, a 14 strain uh, probiotic to this. I call it a microbiotic because it's all to do with the microbiome, uh, the bugs in your gut, basically. We're about 10 trillion human cells, but we actually have about 100 trillion bugs in our gut. You know, we're more bacterial than we are human, yes. yeah. which is extraordinary. Um, and the importance uh, of the gut is that 70% of our total immune system is in the gut. Um, we have over a thousand different types um, and 85% roughly is good bugs, good bacteria. But there are about 15% which are not particularly healthy and that's the problem. On the left-hand side, that's somebody fairly young. It's a fairly 
good balance between that good and bad. But as we age, we suffer from what's called dysbiosis, which is where we have a few more bad and less good. It's well known, it's fact, and that can rise, that can give rise to immunosenescence. That's when our immune system, unfortunately, is not as good as it used to be. So the final yeah. product here is, yeah. you know, it's a live bacterial uh, collection of 14 strains. We have products in there for digestive health, hormonal balance, absorption, yeah. fatigue, and of course, immunity. So my final slide really in closing, just to summarize, um, we're not eating healthily, fact. Yeah. Data shows nutrient deficiencies. Supplementation is necessary to get that RDA. Some RDAs are totally out of date. We mentioned protein, I would add vitamin D to that list. Tackling absorption as we get older is really important. Um, we should be setting RDAs for more nutrients. There are lots of other nutrients like coenzyme Q10 and others that a lot of scientists think we should be adding to the list. Uh, not a fan of single vitamins. Why would anyone buy a single vitamin when we're actually deficient in many more? Ooh. Aging can be slowed, controversial. Um, older adults do need extra protein, controversial. And I say over 50s is a really good time to start supplementation. Why not? and protecting musculoskeletal health is so, so important. And that's basically all I really wanted to say, Steve. Wow, Max, thank you. That's uh, very inspiring. Could I ask one question before I go to some of the other questions that were posed? And uh, that is uh, many of us uh, listening in and uh, also uh, being part of this discussion are part of the consumer healthcare industry. And uh, what would be your maybe three pieces of advice to those of us who are working in the consumer healthcare industry, which is also about prevention as well as, of course, cure in some, uh, in some areas. What, would you, what, would, what kind of advice would you give us? Well, certainly <clears throat> my experience has shown, uh, certainly on QVC, where, where I present on TV on a regular basis, um, I go in there not doing a hard sell. I try and, if you like, take this presentation and put it into eight minutes, if that makes sense. So my number one bit of advice would be, and this came from the research we did, older people were very skeptical about marketing, I'm afraid. They were quite aggressive during the concept groups and told us very clearly, I don't believe any of this nonsense anymore about what marketing people tell us in adverts. Uh, I was quite shocked because um, you know people sp <laughs> spend millions of pounds on marketing, but I think uh, as you get a bit older, you get a little bit, know, a bit smarter. You, you, you're a little bit more cynical, uh, a bit more experienced in life. And they did not believe many marketing messages. So I, I'm a great believer in helping to educate them, share some facts, not do a hard sell, um, and then let them make up their minds. And that works very well with QVC. So be careful. That you, and they said, we don't like marketing people talking down to us. And we get that impression a lot of the time. Um, so that would be a, a bit of advice, certainly. Very good. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, Dave, any uh, uh, a question from you? Or should we pick one from, uh, from the chat just before we finish? No, let's, we've got tons in the chat. So let's pick one of those up. Huh? Uh, OK, um, do you want to pick one up? Just a sec. I just sorry. I just closed the damn thing as we. <laughs> well, let me uh, let me do that. There's one from Irma, Irma, uh, yeah. who says, um, you know, on your slide for the vicious cycle, um, is there any data that actually compares muscle in active uh, adults versus sedentary uh, adults uh, as a consequence of this vicious cycle? There will be a ton of data. I don't have a paper I could send right now, but yeah, there will okay. be a ton of data. I mean, you could say that that MRI scan is a, is a is an extract it's, of a piece of it's data. It's an extraction of that data, yeah. exactly. It's a pictorial yeah. piece of data. Um, and the data on the loss of muscle, if you're lying in a hospital bed with the young versus the older people, remember losing all that muscle from your legs? Yeah. Again, that's data. I think, I, I mean, I could certainly send you the pa Professor Padden paper uh, and there will be a whole stack of stuff there, but there are huge numbers of scientific uh, published papers, peer reviewed papers in the literature, showing very clearly that you need protein, you need exercise, you need leucine, um, you need other things, uh, calcium, vitamin D, these are all necessary for, for muscle 
uh, maintenance. So yeah, there's a whole stack of data. Okay, brilliant. So Max, maybe if you could and, and send it in, we'll send it in with the yeah. recording as well. Could you make okay. a note of that, please, somebody? Yes. Of yeah, course. yeah. Well, Max, we'll, we'll, we've got a bunch of questions, and what we'll do is we will forward them all to you, and uh, hopefully you can give us uh, give short answers that we can send back to everybody that's attended the webinar um, to all these questions. But there was one that was just raised at the end there that uh, Ames forwarded through that um, you know. As a, as a guy that spent his career in advertising, trying to flog things like supplements, um, amongst other things, uh, one of the things is that, you know, behavioral science tells us that, you know, you always get better results when you link things to significant life events, which is why those of us in advertising like to really hone in on the memorable moments of life, right? And so uh, the question is, you know, what would we be better off trying to really hone in on things like, you know, specific birthdays, the 50th, 65th birthday, 75th birthdays, uh, retirements, uh, and align those with, you know, hey, here's reality, you know, uh, or this is the moment for you to change lifestyle, or this is the moment where you've got to really, you know, uh, endeavor to, to do the exercise, think about your nutrition, change the supplement behavior. It just seems, strange, seems to me it's very obvious uh, that we should, as, as marketers thinking about how do we actually push this along, you know, hey, you know, I, I mean, I, I do know that when I was in Japan, uh, my, my, my decade living in Japan, at one point for a big multinational, we did do a little project where we talked about the fact that at that time, the Japanese government was moving retirement from 60 to 62. Um, and so we did some work, which was to target 62-year-olds uh, with... 62-year-old uh, men and life expectancy at that point for a, for a man that lived to be 62 in Japan was 87. So we said, hey, you've got 25 years of life left. Do you want to make the most of it? And then we sort of showed how they could be doing certain things using the client's products, obviously. But does that all sort of make sense to you? Absolutely perfect sense. A absolutely. Um, I, I think retirement is very dangerous. I think a lot of people understand that you know, especially if it's a sudden retirement. I think retiring is very dangerous indeed for a lot of people. A lot of people go downhill very, very quickly when they retire. Very fast, yeah. They don't yeah. think about the rest of their fantastic life and they just want to laze around. Now, lazing around, as, we, as we've said many times, is not good for the, Yeah, you know, sitting is the new smoking. That's what they say. Yeah. It's a little bit, you know, a bit well-worn, that phrase now. But I'm a great believer in it. Sitting is the new smoking. I mean, e even younger people sitting around tapping away on computers eight hours a day is incredibly unhealthy for all of us. And even when we're younger, you know, over time, that can yeah. be chronic disease, buildup of calcium, uh, and, uh, LDL in the, uh, in the arteries. You know, it, it's very, very unhealthy. We have to keep moving. Staying active is very, very important. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you. Makes well, a lot of sense. Um, we've run out of time, guys. I, we could go on for another uh, hour or more on this. This is really a, a, a great inspirational uh, look at this very, very interesting area. So thank you so much, Max. And uh, we're going to pass it back to AIM, I think. You're going to talk a little bit about uh, what's coming next then. But thank you so much, Max. Thank you, Dave. AIM. Yeah, it was great, Max. I enjoy doing it. Thanks. Right. Maybe, well, I, should actually, talk, actually, maybe I should talk about this. So, yeah, yeah. yeah so first, Max, it, it, Max, inspirational. I'm going to take two minutes to explain what's happening in our next session. But I will point out it's 9.04 here in Sydney uh, in the evening. And as soon as I get off this, I'm now going to go out and take my third walk for the day uh, oh, just good. to make you happy. Right? Um, so... Uh, in April, our next guest is Debbie Howard, uh, who is oh, a 15 year old, a 15 year friend of mine, not 15 years old, but she's been a friend of mine for about 15 years. Uh, Debbie uh, lives half the year in Texas, half the year in Tokyo, and has done that for decades now. She, her professionally, she founded and now co owns one of the most successful independent market research companies in Japan. But over the recent years, she's got really into the caring industry and what's happening with personal caring. Um, now, like a lot of us, it came about because a relative got in old age, needed caring, and the realisation hit Debbie 
hey, this is a really difficult life stage, both for the person that's being cared for and for the carer. Debbie has now written a very successful book on her learning about caring. She lectures all over America and in Japan, and she's going to be talking to us about what she's learned about caring, uh, what's involved for both the carer and the person being cared for, um, and, you know, the sort of realities of what that means to healthcare, to the health industry, et cetera, the help that people need. Uh, and she's going to be looking at it from both the American and the Japanese context mm -hmm. so that we get that different sort of shift in two very different sorts of cultures. It'll be in a, a very interesting in, in a session in on the, sorry, the 7th of April. So looking forward to that. April, 8 a.m. Bangkok time, but that's going to be the 6th of April at 7 p.m. in uh, the U.S. In the oh, U.S., yes. yes. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. Pass to AIM. Off you go, Aim. Yeah, I would like to say thank you so much on behalf of our Consumer Healthcare Training Academy team. I would like to say thank you, big thank you to Dr. Max that uh, you gave us such an insightful, informative and really inspiring session. I would like to say a big thank you to ev for everyone who joined us today. I hope to see you all again in April. Hope you all have a really lovely day. Thank you, everyone. Until next time. Bye.